We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. So, Nakshi, can you hear me? Because Nachiket says my voice was not clear. I can change my headphones. I hear you clearly right now. It's fine, huh? Yeah. Okay. So it seems that the IGF website itself is down actually right now. It is, yeah, it's been down for like the past hour or so at least. And so, so it's uh, already time, but let's uh, so actually give uh, five, 10 minutes because I mean, people, it's been difficult, people registering and all. Okay, but, sure. Uh, Dr. UNDP and tell us when you start. Uh, Parminder, I, I do a short, I do a short intro piece. Intro piece. Um, for the first session, is that right? Yes. Five minutes. Is it just me or is it yes. yes. echo? echo? Okay, I, I'm going to have to turn yeah. off. Echo. 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 I don't know how. Is your other computer? I'm hearing a sound of it. Yeah, because he's got two computers on. I think that was why. Yeah, but I, I have the other one muted, but so I don't know what's going on. But it's okay now, actually, isn't it? It's fine now. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, Parminder, I do a short, very short intro, isn't that correct? For the first session. Yes, you would give it. And uh, yes, you will uh, background uh, this whole workshop in the manner you best want it, including the way uh, you were talking about the IGF. And I think there are two backgrounds to the workshop. One is the GNC and one is IGF. And both... Uh... Well, I suggest you do then the... Um, a JNC, and I'll do a short pitch on the IGF um, relating to the kind of presentation I did in the IGF. I'll only be five minutes, and it really is not an intro per se, it's just to say why this whole thing is important. Uh, Cedric, can I just request you to rename your uh, Zoom chat name? Are you able to do that? Uh, I don't think you can rename yourself, can you? Yeah, no, I, I don't have access either. So. No, even uh, he can't rename himself. I'm not sure. I this is identity theft <laughs> going on officially. Uh, screen, screen oh, your voice Sound is very bad. bad. It's very clear. It's echoing. So sound yeah, yeah, it's very bad. The reason there's feedback here actually is if uh, I'm in the conference hall, so I think if there's sound coming back through the speakers, but I think it's fixed now. It's not to do with my own laptop. I'm sorry, is it better now? Yes. yes. Okay. How do we get to go ahead uh, to be live? Can people actually tune in right now? I'm not actually sure because, uh, you know, a colleague of mine is telling me that people are not able to actually, like, uh, access the schedule at the I, moment. I'll ask the techie outside. people here. So I don't know if they don't have email links beforehand, it's probably going to be very difficult for them to while the site is down. So yeah, I think a lot, a lot, a lot, you're supposed to go join through the website links, you know, and then most people will plan to do that because the, the, the process of getting that link emailed to you is quite convoluted as we all found out. <laughs> Well recognize you, Kling. I've done this twice. Actually, it's, it's across the whole system. It's across the whole UN system. They can't right. quite figure out. I, I think the same thing with that Unido, uh, no, not Unido, Unico, or whatever. There's something for conference registration. You have the same problem with site events and all that. Yeah. 
Yeah, but hey, uh, Jamila is here, so maybe she can tell us. Hi, Jamila. Uh, are people able to access? Because the site is down, we're not sure if participants are able to log in at the Deepti, moment. Deepti, Deepti, could I come in? I did ask the technical people right here, and they're telling me that right now we are live, and there's about seventeen people. But I don't know. Is that yes? I can see the seventeen participants there. Is that just ourselves, or who is it? Yes, it is us and a couple more people. Oh no! What I meant is. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. The people who are planning to join via the website are probably having troubles because the site is down. That's what I meant to say. So, hi, uh, everybody. Hi, Tipti. Um, thanks for the invitation. Sorry, I can't uh, put on my camera right now. I, I just tried the website. It is a bit uh, slow, but I received the, the link to join in my email. So I, it, that's how I could uh, join you here. It should be working, but the website doesn't give you any notification that it has sent you a link or anything like that. It's, it looks like it's down, but it, it seems like it's sending the, the, the link to people. Okay, great. Thanks. Good to know, Jamila. So. Okay, um, so Amma is telling me that we're, uh, it's it's uh, up on YouTube and they're able to working it's working pretty well. So we can send that out to folks who might want to join. Uh, Parun, would you like to wait a few minutes or shall we get started? Uh, let's wait for five minutes because in any case we have a lot of time. Uh, and uh, since all that there have been uh, of this location. Uh, though it may not be that many more people will join us, but prudent, I think, to wait for a few minutes. It might be no harm if you just, um, for the sake of everybody as well, just run through the running order of, of the entire event just while we're waiting a few minutes. So session one, if uh, maybe deep tea. Yes. Um, if you just were to reiterate session one, uh, then has five speakers, is that correct? Yes, it does, yeah, it has five speakers. And we run that through to 11, and all five yeah. are online and ready to go, which is great. Yes, yeah. And then we have our four speakers who may not be all online yet for session two. Uh, yes, we're missing two people, I think. Okay. And we have plenty of time then to, uh, to have an open discussion after that. Right, yeah. I see the live transcription. It was working quite well there. Well done. Yeah, it works really well. So we've had a pretty positive experience with the live captioning so far. I'm looking forward to going out and having a look to see how many have arrived. I know there have been quite a few people cancelling at the last moment, but it's certainly very impressive. Um, a venue here i'll say that it's been snowing outside by the way um oh, which yeah. is kind of makes it all look very nice uh, but it is a very impressive venue there's dozens of room there's a huge number of stalls outside that i look forward to later on having a look at so uh, and it seems so far to be really very well organized um there are a few glitches as there always are and i was told yes that the un website went down because so many people were trying to uh, access it early this morning. Sean, is that the same venue where they had one of the pops of UNFCCC in 2018? Huge this, venue. This, this venue here? Yeah. It, it is a very large venue. Is that what you were asking? I think it yeah, is. there I, was a cop. There was a I think, cop in I, I think it is. was called there. I think it's it is, cop. Neth. Yeah, it's called Climate. Probably. It's, it's, it, that's the one that's built on a former coal mine or something? Yeah, um, yeah. That's yeah, right. I think Conference of... 
the, there's a museum here and everything. I look forward to having a look at it later on. And there was a cop here, that's right. 2018. It's funny in the screen and one of the screens in front of me here, maybe it's in front of you, it has the text from the intro IGF thing. We all despise control and desire freedom. <clears throat> Very libertarian type of stuff, isn't it? They're coming out. With, we're all united. Force, can you? Oh, sorry. And then it moves on. But I must say, I only half listened to it, but it seemed kind of funny to me. I'm sure I'll get used to it. We might as well kick off. Who, ha who has control of the live captioning? Uh, I think there is a captioner on this call who is uh, doing this, but I'm also trying to figure because apparently the auto captions are conflicting with her live captions. difficulty. I think people must be having difficulty accessing it because I know the numbers should be more. Um, there would be some on YouTube. Okay, but uh, the numbers yeah. haven't changed. Yeah. Some uh, so are we can start the uh, weekly because no, numbers hard. haven't changed and therefore people have problems with uh, both uh, maybe IGF uh, website or other ways. Uh, and I think we need to just start and get on. Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone, joining us on Zoom as well as on YouTube. I'm just going to start by announcing the house rules. There's some echo. I think it's because Sean. I have right. nothing on here. Nothing on here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so just starting with announcing a few quick house rules. The first one is just to please keep yourself on mute when you don't have the floor. This is just to ensure smooth audio during the session. Uh, and yeah, the mute and unmute button is right at the, at the bottom left for you to use, as is the start video and stop video button. Uh, please feel free to put any questions that you have 
in the YouTube live stream comments or the Zoom chat box that you are seeing here. You can also raise your hand and directly ask a question if you want to, and we will give you the floor to speak. Um, yeah, that's about it. And uh, I hand over to Deepti now. Thanks, Anakshi. Uh, welcome all of you who are joining us today from different parts of um, the world. Uh, I think we are missing Lara Param, actually. I'm just going to go ahead and send her a quick email. But like, uh, while we um, wait for a few of our panelists, and evidently there are issues today with the technical infrastructure of uh, IGFs online. But nonetheless, I want to welcome all of you who are here and who've made the time to be here on um, with us. This is the third in a series of pre-events that the JustNet Coalition has been doing at the IGF for the past three years. Our first one was in 2019 in Berlin on site. And last year, we, um, you know, along with, of course, everything being virtual, we did have the very interesting uh, digital justice conversations that we hosted, uh, which uh, saw the release of our digital new deal. Um, I will let, of course, um, you know, our coordinators for the day speak more about the JustNet Coalition, but I just wanted to introduce for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, both Sean and uh, Parmander. Sean uh, Oshokru has over 30 years of experience dividing his work with, between Ireland and over 50 countries worldwide in evaluation, program and strategy management and design and capacity building. He has written and edited several books, um, articles and papers, and is an advocate for communication rights. He currently serves as the research director at Nexus Research Cooperative, and he's a founder member of the JustNet Coalition. Uh, Parminder Jeet Singh is executive director at ID for Change. His areas of work are ICTs for development, internet governance, e-governance, and digital economy. He has been a special advisor to the UN's IGF and the UN Global Alliance for ICTD. He's also a founding member of the JustNet Coalition and the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. He was associated with the group that helped uh, India's draft e-commerce policy. I now turn it over to uh, them to get us started. And, you know, we'll just um, sort of, I, I think, make hope that you know people are able to navigate the challenges and join us over the course of today's program so thank you all for being here again so over to you uh, Dipi, did you give it across over to me or sean I so welcome everybody and uh, we regret that we are so few of us here because of all the difficulties of uh, organizing a hybrid event and the latest problems uh, about uh, the virus uh, exploding new things and also it seems that the website uh, is down right now uh, but indeed uh, we, we are a small group and let's go over the things which we plan to uh, discuss today. Uh, this uh, event, which uh, is named Digital Policy Making from Below, Ask the Impacted Sectors First, uh, represents uh, the confluence of two things. Uh, one is this coalition, which Adipi was talking about, the JustNet coalition from which I, Sean, uh, and some others present here come. Uh, and second is the place we, are, we have assembled, whether virtually or uh, physically, which is the intergovernance forum. Uh, so, so, uh, so very interestingly, the meeting we are doing today uh, is an intersection between these two, and I'll explain uh, how. Uh, Just that coalition was formed uh, in 2014. Uh, as a group of organizations which were interested uh, in the issues of uh, internet uh, justice and equality. I don't, I don't want to go into the background of that. We know how internet was that great force of freedom and liberty and then how it uh, began to become a force of economic and social control and so, that, so on. And it was felt uh, by many organizations that uh, while there is some good uh, amount of work being done in the area of uh, what is called negative rights, uh, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association, et cetera, in relation to internet governance, 
not much or enough is being done on the side of economic rights about uh, social justice and equity. And this group therefore got together, uh, tried to explore those areas and do advocacy on those uh, lines. And interestingly, it consisted not only of groups which were uh, whose mainstay was digital issues, uh, but also groups who were doing work in many other areas which were already begun to be touched by the digital and they were interested, of course, to come together as a coalition. So that is the journey which started in 2014. And over the years, then a lot of it has been reactive work uh, about how digital should not be, uh, what's wrong with the digital and so on, or what is wrong with the way policy making takes place in the digital arena, how corporate influence has been increasing and so on. So it's, it was a lot about uh, what not and what's wrong with the digital. Uh, however, it was obvious that digital is a very strong force and it is here to stay and is going to fundamentally transform uh, us as industrialization did. And therefore, at some point, we have to also move on to talking about, uh, if not this way, how it should then be. So lately, that's the shift which has been happening. And there also uh, related to it is another shift. Uh, the actors at the heart of Just Net Coalition, including IT for Change and other digital area activists, uh, spent a lot of early years trying to convince large traditional, uh, traditional spoken of in relation to digital organizations uh, about the need for them to come into the digital arena and, and kind of, uh, you know, influence this uh, space. But they were largely uh, not very willing. Of course, everybody who's doing work on climate justice or they're working on trade justice and enough of uh, so-called traditional uh, issues they were dealing with uh, and, and, and not enough time to you know, start looking at new things. There was also the problem that digital was indeed coming in some ways as a Trojan horse uh, for uh, a very rapid form of neoliberalization uh, and corporations capturing uh, not only the economic space, uh, but also policy space and so on. So a lot of these organizations had this reactive way, re response to digitalization and again wanted to say, uh, can this not happen? But last five, seven years uh, or less, these organizations have started to also see that they need to also recognize uh, what should be done with digitalization. And therefore trying to do that, the biggest challenge was to remove the neoliberal part out and try to interpret digitalization in different manners and towards different possibilities. And that's not an easy way to do because uh, the dominant forces were so invested in this digital opportunity uh, that they were hugely funded, forceful efforts to present digital as a neutral, uh, inevitable uh, thing. Uh, and it was either you take it or leave it, but how to crack that and make it uh, look like, well, digital is also something we can use in progressive ways and so on. And that's where uh, uh, we come close to the present. Uh, in the last uh, year or so, we have started developing a, a project, which internally we also sometimes call as JNC 2.0, whereby we have begun to work in a bilateral manner with large progressive organizations in different sectors, uh, whether it's trade justice, media, climate justice, uh, gender justice, uh, agriculture, education, health, and so on. So these organizations work with JNC to try to uh, understand and if possible, redefine uh, digitalization in that particular sector. And then all these organizations, therefore, and the work they are doing with Just Net Coalition would come together to see how we can influence the overall cross-cutting digital policy making. And that's where we say that questions like who owns data uh, or how platforms should be run or what is fear artificial intelligence is not something for technocrats who claim they understand data and AI uh, to tell us, but it is for those sectors who are impacted by these things and almost every sector today is, need to be able to say what is fear justice in relation to health uh, what is uh, equitable AI in relation to education and so on. So, so this is the idea of this project which we uh, have started. Uh, and some of the organizations here today are involved in this project. We are in a very early phase. 
a lot of time to was taken and probably i'll come in and sometime and talk about it in you know forming these relationships and about igf and i'll let uh, sean talk a lot about it igf was born as a sphere of participatory policy making uh, in the digital arena which had its own challenges and specialties it being a meta cross-cutting area but probably that experiment which had great potential is turning a bit sour uh, and we also trying to understand how to uh, how to reliven it reinvigorate it and what kind of participatory policy uh, making models should therefore uh, probably redefine uh, the internet governance forum but here i would hand over to sean uh, who has already been introduced uh, before we go to the panel which will uh, discuss the work they are doing in this new project of just net coalition uh, sean please okay thanks okay, i'll thanks. hang back to um, in a second to introduce the panel members and i will be uh, very brief i'm here in the ballroom in katowice we we have a very small group of us here and uh, um, it, who have managed to uh, get through the registration and so on. I mean, they're doing their best here, but there's still a lot of people arriving and so on. There's some technical problems. I'd also like to welcome everybody on YouTube, where I think we're going to have the larger audience for this, because I, I do think it's a significant event. And that's, uh, that's what I want to just mention very briefly. In a kind of pre-event, a pre-IGF event, I gave a, a short paper, which was a kind of stakeholder analysis uh, of the IGF and I, I went through the various key stakeholders from the digital corporations to the governments north and southern governments uh, in, in uh, large and small and especially, and especially then civil society, society uh, which I think can reasonably can divide, divide it in this context, in this context between, between a digital a civil digital society and then the kind of thematic civil society that is much more much represented more here, who are, here who are involved in the key issues, key issues that uh, people that confront people in their daily, daily lives. lives. Whereas the digital, digital civil society is, is involved, of course, in the whole digital sphere and is a highly specialized area. And the whole thrust of this uh, event is to be able to bring together uh, those two parts uh, of civil society. In the stakeholder analysis that I did, I looked at the power, uh, the motivation, and the capacity or skills of each of the stakeholder groups. And I'm not going to do a presentation here. So I just quickly jump to a couple of the conclusions. Uh, first of all, that the power of civil society and of Southern governments, especially the smaller Southern governments, but actually really all the Southern governments depends to a large extent on the level of cooperation between them and the level of collective action that they can actually uh, muster, if you like, to address the larger players. They are the weaker players. We know that in the driving seat, as, as uh, I mentioned recently, is the, um, as somebody described it recently, is the digital corporate, corporate world in the driving seat. In the passenger seat, you have some of the large uh, countries, member states, then you have in the back seats, uh, you, you have the um, civil society and the UN organizations and uh, somewhere as a spare wheel, you have kind of ethics and all of this kind of thing. If things totally break down, they'll fall back on that. But we all know that the real drivers behind this is the corporate sector at the moment and that the real power of any other sector is going to come through the uh, level of cooperation and collective action. But that in turn depends on the capacity and skills of civil society and of smaller governments of the South and indeed the larger government, but especially the smaller governments on the South who have to rely on others for that kind of capacity building that's there. And the nub of the paper that I presented was suggesting some ideas uh, for things like the regional commissions of the UN, economic and social commissions to support, uh, to provide more effort in supporting smaller countries, but also then uh, linking the two aspects of uh, civil society, those who are involved very much in the digital world and those who are involved in, in the real world, if you like, uh, of the thematic and substantive areas. And that is what this is about. That's what this project was about coming from JustNet. And that's why I'm so excited really to listen to the papers uh, that are coming up. And, and that's why I think this is a really important event because it's only when those two sides of civil society can really exchange and each learn from the other that you are going to get the kind of level of cooperation and coordination and collective action from civil society 
and which in turn is then going to, I think, bring much more enlightenment to uh, the smaller member states who are large in number, but small in power. So with that, I'm going to hand back to uh, Parminder um, to introduce the speakers. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, we have uh, five speakers in the first panel, which uh, uh, consists of people who are now working with Just Coalition, Just Set Coalition on different tracks of uh, what uh, Sean called as thematic area, and I was calling as traditional uh, actors. And I would uh, introduce them one by one as uh, uh, they take the mic. Uh, first would be uh, Lara Merling, who works with the International Trade Union Confederation. Lara is a researcher with work focusing on highlighting the devastating effects austerity policies have on people's lives and economic stability and understanding how globalization and digitalization impact working people. She is deeply committed to social justice, promoting fair economic policies and work for everyone using economic in ways that better the world. Uh, Lara, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is with uh, the International Trade Union Confederation as uh, economic and social uh, policy advisor. Uh, Lara Merling, we are eager uh, to hear you now. I think Ma uh, Lara has been locked out for some reason. So perhaps you could move to the next speaker. I just saw, I think there must be some issue at her end. So if you could move to the next speaker, we can come back to her, I think. Sorry about that. So the next speaker, uh, the first one now, uh, is Junho, Juno Jung from People's Health Movement. And again, People's Health Movement does need uh, no introduction. Uh, Juno is a researcher uh, there. Uh, but if I may use uh, uh, a few words to uh, talk about the People's Health Movement, it is a global network which brings together grassroots health activists, civil society organizations, and academic institutions from around the world, particularly from low and middle income countries. Uh, they currently have a presence in uh, 70 countries uh, and are guided by People's Charter uh, for Health. So Juno, uh, please, uh, we are keen to hear you now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paminda. And hello, everyone. And thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to discuss the work and also hear from other sectors. And it'll be fascinating how this civilization is impacting uh, other areas around the globe, uh, apart from health. Uh, as Pamindas introduced, I'm um, working with uh, JustNet Coalition and from People's Health Movement on uh, impact of digitalization in health. And this is the work done uh, by our working group. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our members uh, for their dedication to this work. So I'll briefly introduce what we have done uh, as our project and uh, issues of mapping uh, the digitalization, digitalization of healthcare. So as you can imagine, impact of digitalization is broad and fundamental in healthcare sectors. And it has many names, such as uh, medical artificial intelligence, mobile health, telehealth, e-health, u-health. And also you've probably heard of precision medicine as well. And digital health promises to pro provide opportunities such as imp improved medical decision making process, empowering autonomy of the patient by providing more data, and fundamentally different levels of diagnostics and prognostics, better drug discovery and development, and of course, better hospital management and so on and so on. Thereby, digital health provides technolog technological fix to old problems in healthcare like lack of universal health coverage, or even power dy dynamics between patient and healthcare providers, unjust and inefficient distribution of resources. However, we think we need to critically question these promises. Uh, digital health is becoming a dominant force in healthcare economy ecosystem. And what is most problem problematic about it is, it is very often bypasses the existing regulatory framework. From a health inequality point of view, it is important to address key issues like whether digital health results or just further entrenching the existing paradigm dynamics to new actors. 
does this health uh, appropriately, uh, appropriately address the existing problems in healthcare systems? Most discussion around such issues have been undertaken through top-down approach and involve mostly states and commercial actors. There is need for more bottom-up civil society-led processes to map and frame this agenda. So that was uh, our initial goal. So initially our work started as mapping of the current issues around the globe to share the knowledge and identify what the problems we commonly share and what differences there are. So our group consists of civil society activities, scholars and healthcare professionals uh, from a variety of ge geographical origins like India, Brazil, South Africa, Malaysia, Nigeria, Greece, France, and of course, South Korea. And we've collected cases that signifies the promises and perils of digital health around the globe. And here are the few findings we've put together. First is on regulation. As an emerging field, regulation on digital health are developing rapidly. And discourses surrounding the development of regulatory frameworks are largely dominated by international organizations and developed countries. And promoting commercially controlled digitalization and data, datafication of the health. These guidelines and agreements may help in further larger flows of the data and digital good, goods, but have little to show on the side of sharing benefits for all, equity, and in general, enlarging the overall social value. And rapid technological advances sometimes make conventional regulatory frameworks obsolete for digital area. This is in turn employ their benefits for, benefits for larger health and tech cooperation at the expense of the public interest. Second is privatization. Traditionally, stakeholders in healthcare include healthcare, uh, health insurance companies, pharmaceuticals, medical devices companies, hospitals, patient support associations, government agencies. What is notable recent, uh, recently is the rise of new stakeholders in multinational data companies and digital devices and software developers. developers. These actors were not considered as healthcare providers traditionally, but rapidly expanding their activities through creating subsidies and merging with existing healthcare and or insurance companies. So today, private companies and especially data companies race to re relocate their big database they can either sell or profit or use to train the improved algorithms or developing profitable tools. However, the supply of big data in global north is not enough to meet the requirements and privacy regulation in Europe north, uh, for example, the GDPR, are growing stricter, especially with such sensitive data as personal health records. Health system in rural resource setting offers potentially vast yet untapped reserve of big data in countries with weaker regulatory controls. Third is transparency. There are multiple layers which transparency needs addressing that can be digital health products, storing and processing of the data or development of regulatory, regulatory processes. Currently, development of digital health is largely driven by private companies where many of these layers are hidden behind the curtains of trade secrets. There are hundreds and thousands of apps in the market and numerous trials around the globe, which efficacy and safety of the products are not scientifically validated. However, many of these digital pro products are not classified as medical devices and, and it is difficult to regulate with existing uh, systems or frameworks. Also, rhetorics of inevitable shift towards digital or unprecedented situation of digital age gave them, it gave them an exemption over careful, careful examination or appropriate offsite. In turn, making digital process obscure or less transparent. Lastly is issues with its applications. Digital transformation in healthcare is often portrayed as just disruptive innovation that will fundamentally change the medical services, like helping public health policy, decentralized management, improving quality of care, patients with better outcomes, better access to information, and so on. However, it should be noted the application of such technology does not happen in empty space, but in, in the existing political economy. So such technology reflects or even exacerbates, exacerbates existing inequalities, both at the local and global level. At the same time, 
the process of this transformation is not purely digital, but requires substantial workforce and resources from healthcare workers. Thus, delivery of digital health technology and application at the ground level should be carefully observed and build evidence from its promises. The case was exacerbated by current COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure you are all familiar with the variety of contact tracing apps, digital checking apps, or proof of vaccination apps up until in the last couple of years. This is just one example of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. And expansion of medicalization is well within our everyday life. Normally, people would not allow such invasive and draconian policies, but this seems this practice is well within our norm now. Some say desperate times calls for the desperate measures, and this feeling of desperation in junction, is un, in junction with unprecedentedness opened a lot of, lot of doors to, uh, to a newly emerging actors in digital healthcare sectors. So lastly, the challenge of digital health for both patients and citizens is that the development of digital health technologies outpace the creation of ethical and legal frameworks for mitigating social equity concerns for protecting people's privacy and also their benefits. Without such frameworks, digital health innovation may inevitably lead to new, new modes of indiv individualizing the responsibility, outsourcing the risk, and privatizing, privatization of the benefit. With the basis of current mapping of the issues surrounding digitalization of health, critical analysis on principle and norms in policies should be conducted and challenges in good governance that can enhance and effectively distribute the social values created by digitalization of health should be identified. For me now, thanks. Thank you, uh, Juno. Uh, I think it was a great uh, uh, description of the kind of challenges a very important sector uh, has faced vis-a-vis -vis digitalization. And I think health sector uh, is very important, apart from the health being important, uh, in the sense that it has a very strong initial impact of digitalization. Uh, and again, health being a sector which is very sensitive, important to our well-being. The dynamics being shaped in the health sector are very important to study and know uh, for us to take general lessons about uh, where digitalization is headed and it should be regulated. And for example, issues of AI in health are some such uh, kind of sensitive areas. Uh, and these are the kind of things we have been exploring with Juno and with uh, People's Health Movement. Uh, and uh, we look forward to doing more work uh, in this uh, this particular track, but of course also, and one of the main uh, purposes of this uh, project is also for everybody to learn from different uh, areas uh, of work. Uh, is Lara uh, here already, Deepthi? Yes. Hi, Lara, how are you? Hi, good. And, uh, uh, and now I welcome you. I did introduce uh, you. So the people are rearing to hear you uh, and uh, of course the views of International Trade Union Confederation, uh, which is such a strong uh, global force for workers' rights. Uh, and uh, Lara, please uh, go ahead. Yes, so you say strong and I can also add extremely diverse. So even looking at it within our membership uh, where we cover you know, 200 million workers in over 160 countries, um, it's not you know, that easy to call us all like one sector because we do have the same vision of you know, workers' rights and what we want to achieve. But even talking to various groups and fragments within the movement, you see that when it comes to digitalization, they'll bring up different issues and different concerns um, that all need to be addressed. But at the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to what we've seen as in the way that technology has been adopted, um, a breakdown and shift in you know, what the employment relationship was like or what in countries where informality was still the main issue, what people would have liked it to be and how that you know, is that still kind of the goal that you can have in an era where digitalization changes these employment relationships and the type of jobs available. Um, 
and looking and asking various you know parts of it um, we've seen that you know the employment relationship is the main kind of overarching issue and then the way in which just technology is adopted in places without any input from workers it's kind of implemented by employers as they wish um, and surveillance data collections these are all problems that workers face and have little say in it and there's been very little regulation in a lot of places and even where it exists it kind of always is one step behind um, and responding to what's already happening. Um, so the question is, within the labor movement in 2017, actually at the International Labor Organization, there was a big centenary declaration on the future of work. Um, and it seems that for most people, that's the main document that shapes the vision on how work careers and you know in that case like governments and employers agree to what should be this vision of how technology and workers rights should be part of you know a way in which um things like data privacy and so on are included in what's seen as workers rights but the main problem we see with that is okay, people agree to that declaration, and then what's the next step? And that's what we sort of lack, a governance framework where you can actually make these things, you know, a reality and implement them in some way. And there's been a lot of national level initiatives in different places that have introduced like bits and pieces of legislation and workers protections, but nothing that's consistent in something that's you know global and when we look at organizing efforts too when asking you know people and unions um, we see that a lot of organizing efforts even when it comes to you know the issue of platform work where it's the main reshaping of relationships you have the platforms that are very visible that provide services you know on the ground that's like a delivery app or a car service app that you see and those are getting a lot more attention than the invisible type of little task crowd work platforms that people don't have to like see and interact and where it's also a lot harder to find those workers and help them connect to each other um, but for a lot of you know the problems and also introductions in the end, the umbrella question is data ownership, who gets to own and control the data and use it for, you know, either to have an algorithm on a platform or crowdsourcing thing or to manage people or to, you know, use algorithms for making any other decisions, like who gets to like decide that and see that. Um, and, we, I think, see it as like there's a big gap in, you know, regulation and decisions. And it's a question where there's no clear answer on, you know, where should these decisions be taken in a fair way? And especially since, you know, there's a vision within this ILO declaration where it's generally where workers' race issues are decided, but no way to like concretely implement that since a lot of the you know ideas there go beyond just labor and outside of the you know jurisdiction and power of like an ILO convention or what that would mean and it's kind of a difficult like uphill battle for us as well within membership to you know convince members and people that this is something that's you know urgent right now um, and important to like engage with still, um, even though like, you know, the more people face these technologies or issues at work, that's kind of where their interest starts to peak on, you know, it's time to like do something about it and engage with it. Um, but it's great that, you know, we can be part of 
practice and have these discussions within our own movement and kind of see even here, you know, how it's very, it's a lot of very different perspectives and still like no clear like agreement on what would be the best way to deal with this governance issue and question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Uh, now, as it was brought uh, up uh, by Lara, the question, the, the world of work and workers is central uh, to, to all, all the kind of changes which are taking place. And what is very interesting from what, how, apart from the substantive aspects, what Lara was relating uh, about the process aspects and this project, the process aspects are very important. Uh, the dynamics between, for example, the dynamic groups, uh, the, the digital groups and the so-called traditional groups. When we talk with the labor groups, uh, the dynamics of the trust building, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to sell digital here? What is it, uh, first of all, has taken a long time and that itself has been a great exercise for us. And then even when the key nodal uh, nodal organization for the project comes around, uh, then as he was understanding, there's an issue of talking to other actors in their area and developing a trust, developing a shared vocabulary. And this project has at least as much been about this process as it has been to figure out uh, precisely what is happening and what can be done about it, which is also important. But I think as we all know, working in the civil society area, the processes uh, of networking, trust building and working together uh, have been very important. And this project tries to uh, explore them uh, uh, across uh, where digital changes are taking place. Uh, thank you, Lara. And our next uh, speaker is Shi Yokling, uh, who's an international lawyer uh, with uh, areas of expertise uh, in environmental, social and economic impacts of globalization, especially in the countries of the South. Uh, since 1993, she has worked closely with three negotiators from Global South, scientists and NGOs to campaign for biosafety and climate justice. She was a member of a Malaysian task force that worked on two national laws related to biosafety and the regulation of access to genetic resources. Uh, Yokling currently serves as uh, the director of Third World Network. Uh, Yokling, please. Thank you very much, Paminda. Um, thanks uh, for, for bringing us together. You know, I think we were we are all uh, different parts of the project that you uh, in just uh, Network Coalition have brought together to try and cross the different bridges uh, so that we have more intersection of our work. Uh, I just want to, as uh, requested by Paminda, um, maybe share a little bit of where uh, our thinking in Third World Network is, uh, where we can actually do more together. Uh, first of all, in terms of, uh, so I'll focus on basically the, the, the negotiations for the so-called digital rules. Uh, I, I have a lot of discomfort and I like us to think about uh, how we want to frame. I mean, it's really a digital economy, the right framing of how we see the future of our societies, because the digital economy framing, which is now used in all our blueprints at the national level, seems to have this impression of the, of, uh, there, there is a sort of image that we are creating a whole different world where workers and farmers and ordinary people and their contribution to the real economy somehow is not as important as this sort of nefarious thing called the digital world. So I, I think that's something uh, I wanted to throw out for us to think about. So in terms of the WTO, which I'm going to focus on, there has been from the beginning a very big push to, uh, to really, and I think this comes from the big tech companies whom today, the big four, you know, Google, et cetera, and some of the governments uh, from the North who actually see a lot of these things coming because of their technological uh, uh, control. And so a lot of these ideas are planted in the different multilateral uh, spaces and our countries in the South, in terms of our government policymakers, let alone negotiators, they are completely always caught off guard. We see it again and again and again. Uh, so, for example, there's been a push right from the, the time when WTO was set up to really create a lot more of these, building the, the, the blocks for what we see today as the digital rules. So, uh, and, and they wanted already a, a legally binding treaty, you know, back in the early 90s when the WTO was first formed. And this is really to, to sort of like lock in all the other pieces of the agreements that had 
put on the so-called trade agenda, things like intellectual property, you know, market access to services, including financial services, uh, you know, liberalization, all economy, pushing for government procurement to be also privatized, but in a limited way because of resistance. And so what we have, of course, is the, many of you may be familiar already, that in the end, uh, there were enough countries like India and uh, South Africa, uh, you know, that see some of these red flags. So the, 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 the compromise was to have a work program on e-commerce in 1998, uh, you know, which is supposed to be really a discussion. But we all know now and back then that anything that starts as a discussion in the WTO becomes the, uh, the seed to basically plant uh, ultimately uh, legally binding rules. Uh, and then we get caught in what we call disciplines in the, in the WTO jargon. So, so there's been a lot of discussion and very little movement on uh, norm making, on rule making, because enough countries were aware of the problems. Uh, and that's quite remarkable. But the one thing that we all know did actually come as part of the package of agreement in 1998 is that there would be a uh, moratorium, supposed to be temporary, on customs duties on e-transmissions, right? Now, this temporary moratorium has been uh, renewed every year, and it's been politically linked with a also temporary moratorium on taking action on intellectual property violations, uh, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the different contexts. So these two have been a kind of a balancing act year after year after year. Uh, and as the whole world changes in terms of what was understood back in 1998 as, you know, e-commerce subject matter, today, you know, e-commerce covers so many different things. So what governments thought they were having a temporary uh, customs duties uh, moratorium, so it won't collect this, this e-transmission transactions uh, duties. Today, we're talking about billions, if not trillions of lost revenue. So in, the, in, in terms of what impact it means for, uh, for the South and for our societies, we all know that, that the revenue that we need to generate for climate change, for, for social services, you know, for all the rights that we want to implement at the national and local level, how do we finance that? And you know, tax revenue is absolutely crucial. So cutting off this potential tax revenue is a big problem. So the, the pressure to have a permanent moratorium on customs duties on e-transmissions and e-transactions is a big fight in the WTO right now. Now, India and South Africa in early November actually put forward a, a, a paper to say, we have to review the scope uh, of what you mean by e-transmissions, what duties and what impact on our societies. So I want to flag that as an important uh, area for us to think about of uh, the kind of work we need to do moving forward. And of course, meanwhile, uh, because there's been resistance, so the sneaky way, you know, the developed countries and the big uh, tech company lobby did was to use Davos. We all know back in 2019, in Davos, there was this whole bunch of different, you know, uh, ministerial declarations, one of which was on e-commerce. And there, you know, we had about, about 70 odd countries, ministers signed on thinking that, oh, it's all right, it's Davos. We all want to make sure that we have something that looks good coming from Davos. And what we got was this political declaration, among others, on e-commerce and immediately before the ink was dry, there was a push with the, with the uh, collaboration of, at that time, the uh, DG of, of uh, WTO to push for negotiations in the WTO. Now, today we have this joint statement, statement initiative, the JSI on e-commerce and a couple of other areas. And this, from the legal point of view, is illegal because anything you want to do in the WTO needs a mandate, including plurilateral. In other words, you cannot have all the members agree that they want to launch a new agreement negotiations. Even if we agree and it's allowed for, you do, those who want to join can join the plurilaterals. You still need a membership of the entire WTO to be able to get a mandate to say, yes, you can start a plurilateral negotiations. They never got that. So this e-commerce negotiations and also on facilitation of investment and other uh, domestic regulation or deregulation, they're all strictly speaking illegal. So together with a lot of the uh, networks and organizations working on economic justice, we have, we have been highlighting this a lot. Now, many, so, so this is a point of action. If they are illegal, then the norm setting should not be allowed. Right now we have about, I think, uh, maybe 80, uh, about 80, more than 80 countries that have, uh, you know, joined this plurilateral uh, on uh, about 86 in total out of the 164 of the WTO membership. About half of these 86 countries in the e-commerce negotiations are from developing countries. And they also include some least developed countries. When we talk about the deep inequities in of the digital world of technology, you know, deep divide and of the kind of economic injustice that comes from this deep divide, 
how on earth are Benin, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, and Laos, you know, in this e-commerce? So they are going to give up everything about localizing your data, uh, controlling the free flow of uh, uh, data out of your borders. So the five areas that are very contentious, and in a way, the work that uh, TWN and our world is not for sale and many of the groups engaging in this sphere, it looks kind of, it is more of a, uh, it's a positive agenda to protect existing policy sovereignty space, uh, but it is actually a negative agenda in the sense that we're trying to push off and, and, and hold back and push back some of the negative things from equity and development perspective uh, that is being pushed around. Okay, so one, of course, is cross-border data flows. The other one is the uh, localization of computing facilities, which uh, is a no-go for the big tech and the OECD countries. And of course, market access to services and goods. Uh, so these, these areas are really where we will have impact on uh, small, medium and micro, micro uh, businesses, on workers, uh, all the things that we care about in this community. Uh, you know, it really is about handing over our entire economy, more of that uh, to a, a set of rules and to more concentration of a few of these big tech platforms. Um, you know, actually a, a few months ago, we, we uh, had uh, together with some other partners, a, a meeting uh, and we were looking at some of these issues. And I like the description of the former South African trade minister, Rob Davis, who say that the companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Alibaba, and Tencent, they now have, and I quote him, a vampire-like grip on digital trade and rulemaking. And it is a vampire-like grip. So I think it, the challenge for us is how do we engage more uh, across our entire community uh, here and others, how do we engage more with the governments? Because the lack of understanding, the kind of buying into the kind of uh, uh, ideological mantra of the digital economy and how, and now with COVID, we will all get out of our COVID depression, out of our multiple economic crisis through digitalization. You know, uh, it really is, is, is phenomenal. The lack of understanding, the lack of uh, analysis and lack of just pure information at the country level. So I think that's a lot of work for us to do there. And I just want to end by also touching quickly. The other area that we need to look at is digital sequence information, genetic resources. That's not happening so much at the moment in WTO sphere, but it is happening in the Convention on Biological Diversity and uh, under that, the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing, where the deep inequities caused by biopiracy since the colonial period is really the reason why we have those treaties. So equity, local communities, indigenous people's rights, uh, conservation and sustainable use, they're all there. And the battle there is how do you treat digital sequence information that the new technologies have now introduced? Uh, and that fight requires us to engage in that space because there are rule making and norm setting going on there as well. And of course, intellectual property is being expanded. Copyright, for example, is being expanded to also have privatization and private ownership of data sets and databases. Uh, it started already in Europe. Uh, and and what, does, uh, what are the implications? So this creeping and sometimes ratcheting uh, is really where we need to organize ourselves. We need to bring together those working on the trade rules, on the economic rules, and not even trade anymore, they're beyond that. Uh, and those who know the technicality, uh, like this community, and we have started that, I think today, two, three years, when we compare to when we first started the Just uh, Network Coalition, we have gone a lot, we have gone, we've moved a long way. I think we've been a bit set back through the COVID because we have been so distracted to so many different spheres. And I really look forward to this project to bring us together so that we can, in the next few months, the, the, the suspension or the postponement of the ministerial meeting at the WTO is a blessing in disguise because there was a lot of pressure. But even then, the few governments are fighting, really, there was no consensus really around the e-commerce rules, but the, the creep is there. And, and, and meanwhile, in the, in the trade agreements like the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, all these agreements, which are existing, which are already enforced, they have provisions in the e-commerce chapter that actually do have serious restrictions, for example, on uh, localization uh, of data uh, facilities, et cetera. So you have already some of the rules and the rules in the making WTO, and we need to pull it all together so that we can actually intervene and bring up our, our positive agenda into the, uh, this arena. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Yokling. Uh, Yokling uh, really talked, especially towards the end also, about the challenges today we have to uh, do advocacy work 
we no longer have the luxury to be in our own areas of work, whether we do climate or gender or trade, uh, but we need to know so much uh, from different areas. Uh, and that alone allows uh, us uh, success. Uh, and that's where the network form of civil society working uh, is very important. Uh, and uh, Joaquin started with, there are some fundamental questions about dealing with digital economy and we at JustNet Coalition face it almost every day because people have this feeling that the very idea of digital, uh, whether it is as Habermas would have put it, taking us more towards the systems or towards the life world and whether it further spoils that balance which industrialization uh, screwed up. So very idea of engaging with the digital therefore have had a lot of resistance and which is true, right? Because uh, that, that problem exists. And then we have to also tell them that if you do not engage, uh, what kind of problems you would face. So, so it's a difficult thing. We do also learn when we go and say this and other people teach us, no, no, these are real problems. And so there's a lot of learning across. So we have to cross learn and work in a network form. But I can't stop myself from saying that this area, what uh, Yokling talked about, was the biggest success area for IT for, for change and just not coalition to work in an intersectoral manner. We were suddenly put together as she described when US brought that e-com agenda to WTO. Uh, then a lot of people in the trade sector did not know what digital was. And then suddenly South Center uh, found that, uh, you know, IT for change worked in some internet governance areas. They pulled us to a WTO meeting. We never knew anything about WTO or digital economy even till then. And we were called to a meeting and I started going there, Richard Hill started going there. And then we were told, no, no, you have to tell us what digital economy said. We don't know what, uh, I mean, at least I didn't. Uh, but how quickly we worked together and at 2019 last ministerial, while some developing countries already had doubts about the agenda, but they never had points and vocabulary to speak up. And if these countries so solidly spoke up at 2019 and said, we will not associate uh, with that uh, agenda. Uh, allow me to boast a little. It was that strict work uh, which trade activists and digital activists did within a year, uh, which created that conditions where South Africa or India could stand up and not only say that we want to say no to what you are doing, and they had certain coherent narrative to back up that. And that, that has carried on since then and South Africa and uh, India have been leaders to resist that. So thank you uh, so much. And that's our early success uh, area, uh, which we are very proud of, and we're going to work more on it. Uh, the next speaker uh, is uh, Cedric uh, Letterme from the Tricontinental Center. Uh, he's a researcher at the Tricontinental Center, also known in short as CETRI, which is an international movement driven institution focused on stimulating intellectual debates that serve people's aspirations. Uh, and Satri's, the organization's roots lie in non-aligned movement and Afro-Asian people's solidarity organization, uh, APSO. They provide the cultural space from which the tricontinental would eventually emerge. And that's, that's their formulation. And Cedric has been working lately with JustNet Coalition very effectively and very well on issues of uh, environment uh, and uh, climate justice. Over to you, uh, Seb. Thank you so much, Parminder. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry that my name is not a... So thank you also to MI to, <laughs> to lend me his profile. I had trouble registering this morning. So this is digital solidarity right, right here in action. Um, I will try to be, uh, to be brief. I'm here to talk about uh, a, a process that we initiated along with other GNC members uh, to try and think about the links between digital justice and environmental justice and especially to try and find ways to better articulate the two. Um, so the starting point was the observation that, although we all know, and it's becoming more obvious every day that digital technologies, they have a huge impact and growing impact on the environment uh, in terms of resource extraction, in terms of energy use, in terms of e-waste generation. Um, we felt that this, it was not sufficiently discussed and integrated both in the digital justice movement and in the environmental justice movement. Uh, on one side, too often maybe um, digital justice solutions or scenarios, they're planned, you know, we're trying to find, figure out ways to make the digital economy more fair, more equitable, more democratic, more decentralized, but maybe not considering this inside of the physical limits that the planet imposes on the process of digitalization. Uh, we hear a lot about, you know, for example, one of the 
sustainable development goals of the United Nations is universal connectivity. What does that mean in terms of actual impact? Uh, when we know that in the global north, people have eight, 10, 15 connected devices already, but a lot of people in the global south don't even have one uh, piece of, of connected device. What does that mean to put everybody on, on, on connection on the internet? And what is possible in terms of, of environmental footprint of this connectivity? Uh, so this is one aspect. And on the other side, we, we felt that the environmental movement wasn't fully integrating the challenges that, that this digitalization process is posing. Um, we don't really see the same kind of mobilization in the environmental justice movement that we see in other industry. For example, in extractivism, on fossil fuel and stuff like that, we don't really see it happening uh, regarding the digitalization process. And maybe it's because there's still this widespread feeling that somehow digital technologies, they're immaterial. Or you also have the fact that it's considered rightfully as something really technical. And so a lot of environmental activists don't really have the tools or they're uh, to engage with this digital technology that seems really technical. So that's why we felt that we really need to try um, and build bridges between uh, those two movements. And so based on these observations, we wanted to precisely build on one of the really great strengths of the, the JustNet coalition, which is precisely to allow and to facilitate those kind of cross-sectoral dialogues uh, in relation with digitalization. And especially in a north-south perspective, which is extremely precious and e extremely rare at the international level, uh, and so we wanted to try and build on that and see how both movements, environmental and digital justice, could learn from each other and work together uh, in this specific area uh, and try to formulate policy objectives and that could sustain a, a just and sustainable digitalization process, but at the global level. So the first step that, uh, that we took, which felt pretty natural, was to convene an event, to try to convene a first meeting uh, that was held in last October. It was a two-day event. Uh, where we got together experts and activists, both from environmental justice movement and from digital justice movement, but also from different countries and regions around the world, uh, to start this process by focusing on you know, different thematic discussions. Uh, first, we had a discussion on the actual environmental record of digital technologies, trying to, to find numbers, to find figures, and also try to see how this record is felt and distributed across, across different regions. Then secondly, we had a discussion around possible scenarios for both a just and sustainable digitalization process. Try to see what could this look like? What would be the technical solutions? What could be the political solutions? Also trying to avoid the pitfall of you know, greenwashing and false green solutions that are emerging uh, now. Uh, and then we had all the whole discussion around policy implications of all of this and how we could try to move this forward and try to build on this to to go over next steps. Uh, so maybe I'll finish by highlighting some of the few takeaways that came out of this, uh, of this event. Um, knowing that this event, uh, we're, we're currently trying to write a fully synthesized report of the, of the event that would be published as soon as possible. So you, probably you'll have the, all the details, but I wanted to share with you a few uh, important conclusions that came out of it. Um, the first one was really the, the confirmation of the usefulness of organizing such events and creating such spaces for exchanges uh, that are still too rare uh, when it comes to bringing together activists and experts from those two movements, but especially, as I said, in a global north and global south perspective. So a lot of participants raised that point saying it's really useful and it's not being done enough, so we have to keep trying to, to organize those moments and create those spaces. Um, the second that was really important was there was a sense of both opportunity and urgency in the current moment to see that these discussions around the environmental impact of digital technologies, they're coming to the forefront. They're being addressed more and more in different areas. So there is an opportunity to seize, but there is also an urgency because there is the risk that this discussion will be uh, corporate capture and you know, directed in, in, in directions that we don't want it to go. So we have to be able to seize this opportunity that this is a growing debate, but we have to be, you know, to act also quickly so that the discussion doesn't get uh, included or misoriented in, in, in bad directions. Another conclusion was the importance of trying to learn and exchange from experiences and mobilizations of both movements. So there were examples like trying to do uh, the parallels between, riven, you know, demands for digital sovereignty and demands for food sovereignty. And there were a whole discussion around how can we learn from those both movements? What, what, what do they share in common? What, what are the differences also between the two 
uh, demands and the way they've been uh, put forward by different movements. So it was a really important to say, okay, we all have to learn from one another. Uh, another aspect that was really important was trying to articulate as much as possible micro and macro solutions. Uh, so we had a lot of talks about trying to build concrete alternatives from the bottom up, like community networks, and how could this could help really to imagine and to create a more sustainable digitalization, uh, but always keeping in mind that those kind of concrete and bottom-up alternatives, they also need uh, to be able to rely on a favorable macro policy environment uh, to be able to flourish. And so we need to, to work on both fronts and we especially need to articulate those kind of two uh, dynamics. Uh, and so I'll just end here by saying that one of the ideas that was put forward to, to, to continue this work uh, was to try and initiate a work of mapping the intersections between the two movements, trying to see where those movements intersect uh, and to build on those intersections to try and see how and where we can act together and learn from one another. Uh, and so probably the next step will be to, to do this mapping of the intersection work and then to convene other you know, uh, events like this and pursue the, the discussion. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Cedric. Uh, it was, and I should especially thank him because uh, in this particular case, it was Cedric's own initiative, which has taken us all this length. Uh, there wasn't too much support from any other uh, GMC, not from the Secretariat, at least there were some other partners who had supported. So thanks so much, Cedric, who took uh, the initiative and in a few months has done uh, so much work on this uh, in this area. What is also interesting in this, uh, you know, bringing together environment and digital, apart from what Cedric talked about, that digital is not still considered as an environmentally sensitive uh, area. Uh, and to start dealing with that uh, very early uh, has been something uh, which uh, we have started. Uh, but also how very strangely both these movements, or the, not movement, these areas, can be uh, are taken by some people as not to be very political, and they're not being, as a subset of being political, so much of a north-south to it. You know, a lot of people just want to talk about environment as if there's nothing north-south to it. And same way with digital, as if there's nothing north-south to it. But we know that uh, to the environmental movement, there is a strong north-south. And in the same manner, there is a north-south uh, to the digital movement. Uh, and both are highly political uh, spaces. Uh, they are not just that middle class advocacy, everything is nice kind of spaces. And that's that's what uh, has been uh, very interesting. And also uh, things which the digital domain would otherwise not very much like, for example, that there should be distributed uh, data activity uh, and as much as possible keep data distributed rather than centralized, uh, which is behind also in a way uh, the big free flow of data uh, arguments or issues which, for example, Yopling uh, would be interested in at the WTO, and how it is also environmentally better uh, to, and not only for the domestic economies, uh, that data does not flow around that much, if possible, right? Uh, because every kind of data flow also has a huge, uh, huge uh, climate and environmental uh, damage uh, impact. Uh, so now we move on to our uh, last speaker for this panel, who would actually take forward some of the things uh, Cedric has been speaking in some ways. Uh, uh, our next speaker is Nat Jano from the EPC group. Uh, Nat is a researcher with extensive experience in development and policy work on issues in agriculture, agriculture biodiversity, biosafety, climate change, and environmental governance in Southeast Asia. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in development studies uh, and uh, has doubled GC, doubled GC in, uh, with law uh, and then took a master's degree in community development and is currently the coordinator and Asia director at the EPC group. Uh, Net, please. Um, thank you very much, Paminder, for the kind introduction and just to say that ETC Group is very, very excited um, to be part of this um, initiative, um, to work with new and old friends alike, and also to learn from the experiences and also expertise of um, friends and allies in different sectors. And 
uh, to us, uh, what is very exciting um, in this initiative is really the idea of cross-fertilizing our analysis and our um, lenses um, in looking at the issues in, around digitalization in the sectors that we are primarily working in. Um, like just listening to Junho, for example, really struck me about the similarities in terms of trends you know, in health and also um, the way we see it in food and agriculture and lots of peculiarities as well that are really, really um, worth um, looking into and deeply. And I'd like to start by um, latching on what um, Yokling said, that, that interesting um, analogy about vampire grip of the, of the GAFAM and the BATEX on digital economy. And that vampire grip is very, very clear, very obvious, and very much increasingly felt um, in the food and agriculture sector. And um, ETC Group has been working in this area for the last 40 plus um, years um, together with civil society movements and social movements um, across the South, um, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And never before uh, we have seen this rapid, rapid um, changes um, in corporate consolidation, corporate power, corporate concentration in the hands of very few and new players as well that are brought into the food and agriculture se sector, the food systems by the technology that they control. Now, like um, we have, um, we're actually um, coming up with a report soon um, to show the landscape of changes across sectors in the food and agriculture industry and how um, digitalization and big data have actually um, enabled or in continue to enable um, further consolidation and corporate concentration um, in this area. Like, of course, we know that the food and agriculture sector in particular, seeds and agrochemicals are now just in the hands of four huge um, corporations, big ag. And what fascinates us is um, the, the enabler is largely um, digitalization in the past um, few years. And all of the, the big, big ag, you have Bayer, Cortiva, Syngenta, ChemChina, and uh, BSF, um, offering digital services um, to allow farmers to, conti to continue their dependence no? on, on corporate um, services um, to provide them advice on, on what to plant, when to plant, what to plant, and, and how. And with all this um, um, visioning of, of agriculture and food in the future without farmers. And um, this is very, like before, like this is a message that is often um, couched with like sugar coated, but not anymore um, in the recent years. It's like agriculture without farmers seems to be the vision that even some governments are actually embracing. In the policy making, um, in the policy making era, and how this is enabled by by um, government um, policies and priorities, both in the north and also in the south, um, is something worth looking looking into. Like you know, um, like most of us who have been following the COP um, in Glasgow, also must have um, noticed. You no, know, like even the U.S. Um, China agreement, and also this big. Um, big uh, platforms that are advanced by US and the UAE are actually heralding digitalization in agriculture. And the images that are being projected and also the statements never talked about farmers. It's just um, precision farming, agriculture, machines, robots. And um, this we see a lot no, um, um, of, of a lot of, of entry points no, for new players to, to, to come in and um, new players um, in entirely new sectors, um, for example, the entrance of agricultural drones um, in that whole big, huge um, sector of farm machineries um, is something that the world is um, seeing now. Like you, we have only a few countries, like China leading the way, for example, declaring agricultural drones as, as part of farm machineries. But for the rest of the world, it's not, but it's, still, it's already being deployed in big scale, particularly in plantation um, farming, you know, like in banana plantations and all that. So you have new players, XAG, DJI, Chinese um, drone makers, and even um, European military drone producers entering the agricultural drone markets and have become players, important players in um, farm machineries. 
and you have all these collaborations and partnerships with big ag with the big players um also um new players um around um how to dispense of their digital advisory services in a more uh profit um profit geared uh, way that would enable profit for all the different um actors all the new um alike and we've also um seen how these developments in the application of digital technologies in food and agriculture are actually trumping um competition policies no in food and agriculture like the capacities and also the 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 terminologies and 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 the existing rules just don't apply anymore you know like um like competition policies are geared towards ensuring that um there is free competition and that prices are are don't don't um hike up um in the process of mergers and acquisitions but they're not sufficient anymore because there's actually much more um the underlying um this um this collaborations that are um actually escaping you know, the current definitions of what collusion means of what competition should be you know like how collusion works um in in agricultural commodities sector that are now heavily reliant on ai for machine learning in terms of trading in terms of determining future stocks um globally and movement of supplies and also um we've seen um in this um area food and agriculture um sector how big bio digital convergences uh work out you know, like look you cling mentioned digital sequence information the application of digitalization in sequencing um genetic resources um that is now enabling a lot of the the laboratory researches um and development research and development processes involving synthetic biology and also all these new uh, molecular techniques um in gene editing uh, which are actually trumping existing norms long held norms and principles in the area of biodiversity food and agriculture including free and fair informed consent like who gave them the consent to digitalize all this um information from genetic resources from traditional um seeds for example also the whole um discussion of access and benefit sharing or biopiracy uh, no longer applies you know, because of the the application of digital technologies on genetic resources and of course um how farmers rights and also um the rights to the right to repair which is almost sacred no um when it comes to farm machineries big and small um alike in in the north and in the south are being impacted by this um corporate the the vampire grip of of corporate um interest on food and agriculture and we're and we're talking of of vampire grip um it's not just the big ag but big tech going into all this um into this sector like all of us know about um amazon investing in in um retail um brick and mortar store by buying whole foods uh but very little is actually known and understood about the increasing investments of companies like google facebook on on um companies in the south that are um focusing on digital um economy and also um uh, food delivery for example the investment of facebook and and google on gojek um in indonesia and also in reliance in india are things that need to be um to be interrogated so there's actually a lot lot more that uh, we really are excited to look into like we are organizing a series of dialogues um in the past months um largely um at the regional um level and all of these streams are going into um a, an, an initiative of two big meetings that were organ one what they were organizing in the next two weeks of the advisory group um that is going to guide um the process and also the content of the big discussion that we're organizing in in February also we're putting together an issues paper um and i'm actually struck not the uh, the 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 structure and also the key highlights of the issues paper in in the health sector that was shared by um jung ho that um there's also that's as i mentioned earlier there's a lot of 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 similarities um that are worth sharing and um really um worth cross fertilizing each other in terms of of analysis so that um is largely what i want to to share and i think before i end i have to really um 
emphasize that when we talk of food and agriculture movement, um, these are actually um, groups not just working um, at the global level in terms of policy, but also those that are working at the ground level that are pushing for food sovereignty and food security um, in various forms and really protecting the rights of communities to make decisions on the future of food and agriculture and not leaving this in the hands of corporate corporate players. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Nat. I'm going to take over here uh, for a moment. We have a few minutes for questions, I think. Uh, and um, we have a couple of other people here uh, as well in the ballroom. If they would like to come up, they can ask questions directly into the microphones here. Uh, otherwise, please put your questions into the uh, chat uh, section uh, on the Zoom link. But uh, while people are thinking about that, I, I, I mean, I, I think that any um, campaign initiative or any kind of movement goes through different phases. It begins with the questions that are being put. And I, I think that a JustNet has, and, and the people certainly that you've had here, but the JustNet meetings that have convened the people over the last number of years have really posed all the right questions in terms of how are we going to link these different issues, link the different parts of civil society in order to build the capacity and knowledge. But then at the next stage, you get to complexity. And what I have seen in, and I'm, this is not at all a disappointment to me, it comes as no surprise in the, last, in the five speakers, is how different all of them are responding to what appears to be the same issue. Uh, because of course, the whole point about these digital platforms and so on is that it means such different things in different uh, areas, thematic areas. Uh, and this is the real challenge for civil society. Uh, and this is, if I have questions then uh, to the panel, um, what I would ask is, um, what are the common issues that are emerging here? For instance, data ownership has been mentioned a number of times. Uh, the digital community or digital uh, uh, commons is an issue that hasn't been mentioned, but that comes up a lot, a, a lot as well, or digital transparency, because it certainly strikes me that if solidarity, a wider solidarity is to be built, a number of key issues are going to have to emerge. So that's one of them, uh, whether you can see some issues beginning, and I know towards the end of this uh, uh, JustNet uh, program and initiative, there, precisely this kind of thing is, is going to begin to happen, but I'm just anticipating. The second is that uh, Yokling mentioned, um, as an aside, whether digital economy is the right framing anyway. And I, I really agree with that. It does really make it, you think. Uh, it, it's like calling you know, the early part of the 20th century the oil economy or something like that. It soon becomes jaded, but it suits the industries at the time to allow them to determine the agenda. And linked to what Nat said about the invisibility of actual farmers in what's happening in the food and farming se uh, sector, it's as if they don't exist at all. And in fact, to many, that is precisely what appears to be happening. They're not going to exist. But in the meantime, the people have disappeared out of these sectors. So the second question there is around the framing, whether or not it's possible to frame uh, these, this, what is happening in the whole uh, digital era in a way that doesn't put digital in there, but puts somehow people uh, back into the framing of the issues. Okay, so have we any questions coming here? Uh, go ahead, right next to me, we have somebody willing to ask a question. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Niels Brog, my name, from DW Academy, also collaborating with uh, LogNet from uh, Basomatic IPC. My question, adding a bit on what uh, Sean was asking, uh, I really find impressive the work of the, the coalition on the intersections, the different uh, point of views. Uh, and since language was brought up as a topic, so... Um, how do you work on this? Because you are uh, 
uh, coalition from so many different places and uh, not of all of the actors I imagine that are on the ground speak English. So uh, what is uh, your strategy on those barriers that uh, are very exclusive in, uh, in many moments and that were already brought up at the uh, regional or national IGFs also before that language uh, remains a big barrier and uh, for those uh, yeah global fights and, and movements around uh, food sovereignty and decentralized internet uh, i would like to know if you have any suggestions or, or findings how to be more inclusive uh, thanks I, i don't see any questions coming in the chat so maybe the uh, panelists would like to respond to those issues Well, maybe just a quick response. I, I think, you know, the language issue is not just for this set of uh, challenges. It cuts across everything we do, uh, you know, because we I made mean, the two levels. One is that more and more of the decision making and the framing of what are priorities and, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's gone very global and global, not in a multilateral sense of the UN, for example, but global in the sense of really in every sector, uh, whether it's tech companies or agribusiness or pharmaceutical sector, Uh, you know, or the oil companies, uh, it's such a concentration uh, at the corporate level, and this is what ETC does so well in, in exposing in those different sectors, is when decision making goes to that level, then it is almost a deliberate strategy of uh, uh, to, to mystify all of these things. So there's not just the local population who are so impacted directly, who uh, have to catch up on, on what's happening, but even government decision makers and negotiators when they go to all these spaces are, are quite lost. So, so I would say we need to demystify at two levels. One, the, the, the technicality of it, whether it's law or technology or, or, or you know, whatever. And, that, and of course, you know, in terms of how you get that message uh, and that content and the substance into the, the, the country level, and most of our countries have also diverse languages and communities, they're impacted differently. So that's always been the challenge for civil society. How do we, uh, you know, take every one of these issues and then we have to look at how it, in, it impacts on different parts of our society, but not in a silo way, but to bring it together. So we have a lot of experience doing that. I'm not saying we, we, we have solved all the problems, but it just shows the, the, the scale of what that's needed uh, and we need to step up. Uh, so the intersection among ourselves And just knowing what's going on and learning from each other and then how to take that back to our different constituencies uh, is, is, is always necessary. Thanks. Are there other uh, comments there from the other uh, panelists to uh, the questions that were posed? No, Shan, can I just add a bit? Like, um, as Yoping said, um, of course, language is... is An, an issue, not just in this uh, particular initiative, but across uh, many. I think the pandemic has also exacerbated um, the the connect the co the connective uh, because of the connectivity, um, the access issue, like um, the infrastructure um, challenge, has also added to the language um, challenge. Like we did raise this um, initially in our initial conversations with uh, IT for Change. When we got into the project, not that the language uh, barrier, and this is in particular um, challenging for regions like um, Asia, where you actually don't have a common language that you could use um, to to communicate. And um, a lot of us, actually, the movements working at the regional and global level are relying on allies who have um, organizing infrastructure at the national and local local level, which has been challenged, as I mentioned, during the pandemic, because meeting um, in flesh, in person, to be able to really connect to grassroots um, and communities that are actually impacted by digitalization in food and agriculture um, is almost next to impossible still in, in some countries, you know, like um, in, in where I am, um, the Philippines, uh, for example. So I think we have to also take this um, into account, but also um, take advantage of the of the vast networks um, of, um, involved in the movements that we are operating. I'm I'm aware of the time, but I'm going to ask uh, if the other uh, others would like to respond. The other panelists would like to respond briefly before I move directly to the second session.
we have about 50 minutes and uh, I don't think we can go beyond that. So in fairness to the other speakers, we'll have a other opportunity later on to come back in, I hope. And in fact, the questions that I pose, I have to say, are more to do uh, with the subject of the uh, second session, because it kind of uh, is about really, where do we go from here? Um, it's entitled a, a new paradigm of digital uh, policy making. So it, it really is about uh, what are we going to make of everything that is being learned and where can it, uh, what, what, alternative can, what alternative paradigm can we suggest in the whole area of digital policy making? Uh, Parminder, you may have been going to do an intro there, but I, I think if we just go uh, straight in, uh, given the amount of time, it's probably fair to give the speakers the time. Our first speaker uh, is Nach Iket Udupa uh, from MKSS, Mazdur Kisan Shakti Sangatan. It's a people's organization and a part of a growing non-party political process in India. MKSS works with rural poor uh, workers and peasants from the central districts of the northwestern India of Rajasthan. Uh, the organization was born of a struggle of community land held illegally by feudal landlords, which is not unique to India, as we know, and currently work towards strengthening participatory democratic processes and to collectively uh, fight exploitation. And now, Chiket, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to come in right there. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm just joining from a rural area, so I just wanted to check once. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Uh, like Sean was saying, I work with the Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangatan, uh, which stands for, it's basically an organization for the empowerment of peasants and laborers. And I work with farmers and uh, you know, Nat is helped by sort of laying out the framework very well on how digitalization is taking place in agriculture. Uh, but just in terms of what's happening in India very quickly, uh, there has been quite a push off late on digitalization and governance. And that has also come into the agriculture sector. Uh, earlier this year in June, the government put out a draft a concept paper on what they call the India Digital Ecosystem of Agriculture. And I'll just come to that in a bit. But, you know, similar things are happening across sectors. Uh, similar papers have been put out in health, in education. And so there's a broad digital push uh, in governance that is taking place in India. And specifically on agriculture, the, uh, you know, if, if we go by the, uh, the topic for today, it's, you know, ask the impacted sector first. So the team that put together the concept paper for agriculture didn't have a single farmer representative. So, you know, in the whole conceptualization of policy uh, in the space, uh, there was not one single farmer. And there were some other issues also. The paper was put out in English. And just like, you know, uh, just a very short while ago, we were talking about issues related to language. So India, uh, I mean, most people don't speak English. And, you know, language also varies greatly even within the country. So one issue, like others also spoke about earlier, is that it was put in English. But the content itself is so technical and English speaking farmer also would find it difficult to understand what they are communicating. So one is, of course, that, you know, different languages, but second is also the way it is being talked about uh, is so technical that, uh, you know, non-tech folks, even though they are affected by it, may not really understand what is being said. Uh, and all this is, of course, apart from issues of uh, digital access, which is also still a problem. And broadly, one big problem with this was that the thrust, you know, like uh, earlier speakers were also talking about, is digitalization often leads to deregulation. So there is regulation in the ex existing, um, you know, brick, uh, brick and mortar markets. And uh, when these markets then come into the digital space, uh, then there are no mechanisms that are being enforced for regulation. Uh, there are no grievance redress mechanisms. And uh, farmer consent, uh, consent, one is, of course, from a privacy point of view, but also consent, uh, you know, even before features are being developed, what is being developed with their data. So, you know, getting feedback from farmers or other affected people about 
how the data is being used and what is being done with it and asking for their inputs before developing something rather than developing something and then say take it or leave it and you know because leaving it uh, is is often has a lot of negative impact so you have to take it but you don't have a say in what is being offered to you uh, you know to take so these were some broad issues with it but uh, just how we then went about you know what we did after that uh, so i am also uh, the organization i am with is a part of a larger alliance called the alliance for sustainable and holistic agriculture uh, so we organize some round table discussions with people who are interested in issues related to digitalization in agriculture uh, also with it for change and uh, parminder and we came up with a response to this draft that was put out uh, i'll also share that in the chat in case anyone is interested uh, and this draft was developed uh, by organizations working on agricultural issues along with organization working on digital issues so uh, that was one and it had uh, this paper was this response was endorsed by about 90 organizations and the, again you know the organizations endorsing also had a mix of those working on digital issues as well as those working on agricultural issues and now going forward also what we want to do is we have realized like was even uh, you know people were talking about earlier is there are many issues that are specific to agriculture context specific to a particular theme or sector but there are also cross cutting issues that are affecting other sectors and because digitalization is happening across sectors in india there are some common issues between what's happening in agriculture what's happening in health labor education etc so going forward what we're thinking of doing is organizing a, a meeting or a conference uh, which is across sectors and also multi stakeholder but multi stakeholder in our terms so you know trying to get industry and government also part of the dialogue because ultimately those are the people we want to speak to they are the people uh, whose minds we would like to change so having them there but having them on there on our terms and uh, so first is to discuss within civil society across sectors come up with a common response to what is happening a common set of demands and then you know sort of post multi stakeholder stakeholderism where we have various stakeholders but it's not uh, a corporatized multi stakeholder stakeholderism but rather multi stakeholderism in in terms that we would like so i'll just stop here and uh, thanks for having me i'll also just put another link in the chat which has some uh, resources on digitalization in agriculture in case anyone's interested uh, thank you that's great. Uh, thanks a lot. I just had a quick look at that first document you put up and it looks uh, really, really interesting. Uh, well done. And I, I love, well, of course, you're ahead of what I was saying there, developing the common positions. But I also love your idea of multi-stakeholderism, but multi-stakeholderism on our terms, because this, of course, has been the issue and it's the issue in the IGF and in so uh, many other forums. You have this multi-stakeholderism, but it's not on our terms, our there being the people uh, and humanity, if you like. Uh, so it's a kind of a, a new post multi uh, stakeholderism, as uh, Parmin mentioned earlier. I, I got to, uh, I'm going to move on um, and I'm, I'm, they've, they've usefully put up a clock, a countdown here because they really do shut down at one o'clock. Uh, so, Richard, uh, I'm going to ask you, of course, as always, to be brief, seven or eight minutes. Um, uh, Richard serves as the president of the Association for Proper Internet Governance and was formerly a senior official in the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU in Geneva. He's been involved in internet governance issues since the beginning of the internet and is now an activist in that area, speaking, publishing and contributing to discussions in various forum. And, of course, very much a found, founder member of JustNet Coalition as well. Richard, are you there? Please come in. Yes, uh, thank you, Sean. Um, I really don't know what to say because uh, everybody who came before me uh, said uh, uh, everything that I might have thought of saying uh, better than I could say it. So I think I'll take a slightly uh, different uh, different tack. Uh, it's depressing, but let's uh, think about the pandemic for a moment. 
And what we saw is that uh, people didn't rely on private companies to sort things out. The governments took over. Now, I agree with those who criticized the governments. They didn't necessarily do things right. Nevertheless, they did something. And in every case where something was done, it actually helped uh, to alleviate the, the, the situation. Again, it could have been done better. But if we hadn't had governments, this thing would have run wild. Uh, and in fact, we wouldn't even have the vaccines because the vaccines were developed uh, so quickly because of in, a very, very considerable government funding, which was ad hoc just to develop this, uh, this vaccine and then subsidies to the production of the vaccine, et cetera. So to me, the pandemic shows kind of the return of the state. We have seen this trend to uh, a neoliberal trend to, well, you know, governments are inefficient. Uh, the World Economic Foundation uh, says, well, we need something else. Well, guess what? When we got a crisis, uh, and excuse me for being vulgar, the shit hit the fan, what did we rely on? We relied on governments because we don't have anything else. The other thing that we saw from the pandemic is that we don't have enough international cooperation. The World Health Organization is basically ignored, at least in the big developed countries. I think developing countries do rely on it, but it's ignored by the big developed countries. If you look at their website, you'll see that they actually publish extremely useful uh, and sensible information about what to do, but big countries don't care. So we don't have enough international cooperation. And of course, that's been part of the problem. As we all know, the Omicron variant is probably due to the lack of vaccination in developing countries. And that's at least partly due to the restrictions on the exports uh, and local production of vaccines created by the patent system. And that's, uh, again, one of the great faults of the WTO is the TRIPS waiver. Let's not get into that here. But basically, it's clear that there's a lack of international, sufficient international cooperation uh, to get things going. So what do we need uh, in our area? Well, it's pretty obvious that we need greater international cooperation and we need greater involvement of the people. And probably the only way to do that right now is to rely on democratic processes in those governments which are democratic. I happen to think that there are very, very, very few of those. There are lots of so-called democratic governments that I don't think are actually democratic. Nevertheless, what can we do? So there have been attempts to invent non-governmental structures, but as all the speakers have pointed out, and Sean, you've mentioned this repeatedly, well, they're not actually democratic. They're highly exclusionary because who shows up? Well, first of all, people who master English. Well, okay, that's already a small number of people. Even of those people who master English, if you go to those meetings, you'll find that it's actually the native speakers. The people like uh, Sean and myself, or Harminder, I consider you now a native speaker, people who really have advanced mastery uh, of the language. And the people who speak English, but you know they don't speak it so well because it's a second language and they don't use it every day. And they probably understand everything, but they're hesitant to make interventions. When they do make interventions, they're maybe not as well formulated uh, as they are when people are native speakers, so they don't get as much traction. And, and so there's really uh, a, huge, uh, a huge imbalance there. And then of course, there's the funding issue, who goes to the various meetings, et cetera. Well, now with Zoom, anybody can go, but guess what? Decisions are not being made. Decisions only get made face-to-face. -face. Who can afford to go to face-to-face? -face? Well, people who have money, who has money? Corporate lobbyists, and people funded by corporates. And as many of us know, in the area of internet governments, uh, there's been a lot of astroturfing you had, at least until about three, four years ago, you had civil society organizations showing up, which were actually funded and, and pushing uh, the corporate line of the big internet giants. Uh, so it is an issue of what we do. And I'll just conclude by saying, well, we know what we should not do. What we should not do, as, uh, as uh, Yoko Ling uh, very eloquently explained, is allow the World Trade Organization and other trade agreements uh, to be used to come up with binding treaty level provisions that actually enshrine the status quo, because that's the name of the game. Uh, the, their e-commerce uh, joint statement initiative, which I agree with Yokling is entirely illegal, is looking at a whole range of topics, but when you drill down, what they're interested in is only one thing, it's free flow of data, in order to have the hammer lock uh, on the digitalization of everything that we just discussed, and in order to have the hammer lock on the artificial intelligence, that again, will be used to drive uh, all, all sectors of the economy uh, in the future. So priority one is kind of block that stuff from happening because that's their present danger. 
And then building on that, uh, we need to find uh, other mechanisms, which I think uh, have to involve a combination of uh, new civil society initiatives uh, and also greater engagement in the existing organizations, which are not entirely captured by business. For example, UNCTAD, uh, for example, Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, perhaps even ITU. I know a lot of people don't like ITU and it is a bit difficult for civil society to participate. Nevertheless, efforts uh, could be made uh, to do that. Uh, so it, it's, a long, it's a long struggle ahead. Uh, step one, prevent the status quo from being enshrined in uh, trade agreements. Uh, step two, develop new mechanisms which are much more open, much more participatory. And indeed, we have to address this language barrier and, and that's, uh, that's difficult. Interpretation uh, and translation uh, are expensive, but I think it's going to be uh, something that's essential uh, going forward. And I'll stop there so we have more time for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. You did you did manage to add something there, I think. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I, I like it. If we didn't have governments, this thing would have run wild. You were talking about COVID. Um, but actually, this is, of course, precisely what happened during 30 years of neo neoliberalism, which happened to coincide when, when the digital world exploded and it has indeed run wild. And we've seen the consequences of that. And we're talking about the consequences of that. Uh, one of the things that um, you said there, uh, and I, I totally understand what you mean by it, we need more government, meaning that at least you have a modicum of democracy within there um, if we are going to move forward in this. And the alternatives, it is the, the best worst solution at the moment. But I think you then went on to add that, of course, the issue is how can you get governments to respond uh, to people's concerns far more through civil society organizations. And also, and I agree with you here, through recruiting those UN agencies, both regional um, and uh, global, uh, on your side and getting them to be a little bit more daring and to actually say what an awful lot of them really believe about what is happening. So I, I do think there is a huge need there to kind of find our allies and to work on them more with clear messages for them and via them then to enable the governments who are the ones who should really be uh, pushing these decisions. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Richard. I'm going to move on now to Amber Sinha from the Center for Internet and Society. Amber is a lawyer interested in technology, the internet and how the law engages with them. He's int intrigued by the impact of emerging technologies on existing legal frameworks and how they need to evolve in response. He's currently executive director of the Center for Internet and Society, and he manages programs on privacy, big data, cyber security, and AI. Amber, go ahead. Uh, hi. hi, thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks a lot to the IT for Change team, both for inviting me and also uh, you know, helping me considerably with all the logistical issues and eventually joining this session. And not Tane Mahindu, but, uh, but yeah, thank you for providing me with the login to be able to join this session. Uh, I'll largely, I think, pick up from where most of the earlier speakers had left off. And, uh, and additionally, I'll try to maybe uh, talk a little bit about the policy making process itself that Nachike touched upon earlier and some of the key sort of uh, problems, both in terms of narratives that are built around digital solutions and then lack of participation of uh, relevant stakeholders, which then lead to bad policies. So I think, I think what we see uh, both uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic, but also uh, to a large extent before that, is the positionality of certain kinds of digital solutions as integral to uh, to solving various kinds of socioeconomic problems. So for instance, in India, uh, if you look at solutions ranging from you know, what, what have been positioned as general purpose uh, digital technologies such as digital identity, or specific solutions that have emerged in sectors such as healthcare or finance or agriculture. To a large extent, uh, these, uh, 
digital solutions which are either endorsed, backed, or legitimized through policy making in the form of, uh, you know, at, in the form of you know either policy making efforts such as legislation or executive order or smaller policy making efforts which might involve private public partnership or uh, just an endorsement of uh, of a particular version of that technology by the state. Uh, I think to a large extent that has occurred without an actual analysis of the problem statement that those uh, digital, pollution, uh, digital solutions are intended to solve. And, uh, to, and what we can clearly see is the, uh, is the presence of, of various kinds of vested interests which uh, position uh, you know, specific digital solutions increasingly solutions that involve uh, more expensive and more complicated technologies such as artificial intelligence and big data, data driven decision making, algorithmic decision making. Uh, and again, the, the, the version and the form of the technology that we see more and more are, are primarily based on a very vendor driven imagination. So if you take the example of something like digital ID also, there is a particular imagination that we saw in India, and we see versions of, this, of a similar imagination being peddled across the, the developing world, uh, is that of centralized uh, biometric repositories uh, without any recourse to, to the problem statements that, might, that they might solve. So, so for instance, in India to begin with, the focus of the solutions was to reduce leakages and frauds in our public uh, food delivery system. And, uh, and an entire uh, infrastructure, digital infrastructure was created uh, with that as the primary problem statement that it was intended to solve. Uh, what we have seen is much cheaper examples of digital solutions that could have significantly reduced uh, such leakages without having to you know, require an, an entire overhaul of our identity infrastructure. So what we see more and more are uh, digital solutions essentially positioned as uh, as saviors of, of, of you know, and intended to solve problems, you know, of corruption, problems of leakages, problems uh, due to lack of formalization. Uh, and what we don't see is in the whether at the outset or at the stage of implementation, any real uh, consideration with regard to involving the stakeholders who are most impacted by it uh, in any kind of, uh, of policy or technological design making of that solution. Uh, to give you another example, for instance, in healthcare, uh, what in India what we see is the, the use of, uh, of what is self-identified as AI-driven diagnostic tools, which are intended to democratize the healthcare uh, services, uh, particularly in rural areas. Uh, and what they often then tend to do is to treat uh, those demographics in the population as, as an experimental test set for untested technologies and position them you know, in, in, in the form of, uh, of initiatives which would reduce uh, fraud, which would reduce uh, lack of access and lead to greater social good. So the, the larger sort of problem when we have tried to critically look at, at, at a lot of these digital making processes is, has been, as Najika pointed out, the lack of involvement of, of the appropriate stakeholders. And I think that's the, uh, uh, the, the, the key sort of challenge lies. And I think uh, we are seeing more and more some examples and some models uh, of how uh, most stakeholders can be involved. I think the language barrier, uh, how, how to then you know essentially get the seat in the room, a seat at the table, uh, how to speak to the right people. Those are capacity challenges that the state also faces. Uh, but I think one of the big failures of the state is is actually not. Uh, interrogating vendors that they employ more critically in terms of providing 
uh, a clearer uh, roadmap or a clearer outline of how uh, the solutions that they are intended, uh, that they are positioned to solve are, are actually going to lead to specific outcomes. And I think that's the, uh, that is where we see fairly lazy uh, action from the states in terms of not uh, critically looking at uh, at tenders, not critically, not asking uh, more difficult questions of vendors in this space. And, and for a lot of so, sort of key technologies, I think globally also there are a, there are a handful of vendors which which dominate certain technologies, and then we see larger networks of uh, in, in different regions of different kinds of, of partners uh, that are involved uh, in the setup. So for instance, uh, we've been looking at the, uh, the vendors who are involved in the, in the provision of identity programs globally and what sort of nexus that we see across them and then how uh, you know, to a large extent they are also able to bypass fairly basic rule of law procedures and get access to a lot of data uh, that they have no business getting access to. So the I think the key challenge uh, that we face here are, are largely driven by very, very clear profit motives and the infestation of, of several global organizations and the global narratives, including something like the sustainable development goals by, uh, by uh, the sort of profit-driven agendas, and uh, and then the narrative that is created by it is, is actually very very difficult for uh, for even local civil society actors like ourselves to counter. Uh, particularly, uh, and and most of these questions that we raise are also seen as antithetical to the welfare or the development agenda. So I think that's that's a challenge that uh, digital rights organizations face significantly. And that is also increasingly a challenge that I think uh, grassroots organizations are facing when they start critically looking at uh, solutions that are being imposed on them. Uh, I think the, the sort of key solution that, uh, that we have tried to look at is the need for, uh, for more sort of resources that on the ground movements and organizations have to evaluate systems that they're dealing with. So we created an evaluation framework for identity solutions and we're working on uh, this week releasing a decision guide for technology and policy design for the same thing. And in other uh, kind of verticals, we work closely with uh, gig economy workers in India uh, with regard to the impact that uh, uh, digital solutions have on their uh, labor rights, so I think those are some of the issues which do involve, which I think require uh, creation, creation of guidances and resources that uh, on the ground movements and organizations can use more effectively. And uh, what we would be very keen to also is to have more of these conversations uh, to explore collaborations and synergies towards that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a, a lot, uh, Amber. Uh, that was really useful. Um, I, I love the idea of the digital as uh, being a solution looking for a problem, but not just that as being a highly profitable solution uh, looking for a problem, any problem, and they can solve them all, as we know. And so there's therefore kind of no need really to consult anybody or ask anybody what they need because the digital corporations already know what they need. Uh, and this is a huge problem, then you can end up with these highly expensive, inappropriate solutions, or you can have people and communities being used as guinea pigs to uh, test out new technologies. Um, so, and then I, I think it was very good the way you pointed a way forward there to involve more stakeholders, but also the practical solution that you talked about, resources to evaluate systems um, that communities and other stakeholders uh, can use. And that certainly adds a very practical element to the possible agenda of uh, the uh, initiative that we're talking about here to come up with those kind of uh, templates for those resources to enable a real evaluation of what's going on here. Um, I'm going to hand over to Parminder for our final speaker, and then we should have a few minutes uh, for questions. Parminder. Thank you, Sean. And now I'll invite 
our last speaker, uh, Jamila Venturini, who is from Brazil and heads uh, Derokos Digitalis uh, from Chile. Uh, before I ask her to uh, speak, I, I must apologize her and then congratulate her uh, for these reasons. The apologies that we, uh, she was not on the initial speaker line and she has agreed to join us uh, because Deborah is uh, missing, uh, who was supposed to be our speaker. Uh, and I must also tell you, uh, Jamila and others, that actually you uh, were to be part of the speaker's list. And then we really scanned and said that no Latin American can get up at four o'clock and be here. And therefore, we just did not get any Latin American or uh, even USCN person uh, because we thought it was not practical. And that's the only reason you are not here. And the congratulations is for you for having got up at four o'clock or 4.30 or whatever it was and for being with us, uh, which we really, really thank you for. Uh, and also to put another context, uh, Jamila uh, and uh, Derekus is also an organization which we have been in talk with for this, this specific project on the media track. And we will continue the discussion later on. However, meanwhile, we had spent, and I and Sean actually have spent a lot of time trying to get mainstream or traditional media people uh, onto this, this project, which all of them were very interested. And we are also talking to Jamila's organization as a digital actor uh, to come on to this, uh, this, this track of work. Uh, and we had very interesting you know, uh, discussions with the traditional media group, which were all very, very interested, but somehow that couldn't uh, work, but that keeps on going on. So Jamila was a part of our scheme, both for this session and for the JNC 2.0 the project and here, we have her. Uh, thanks so much uh, for uh, getting up so early to be with us. So Jamila, since I am not sure whether you were prepared uh, for this session, you have just come up. So I'll pose you for you a question. Uh, you are ready. Uh, you are welcome to respond to or comment on whatever got said here. Uh, you would have read uh, the workshop note as well, and we are, we are happy to hear your comments on it. But the point here is to uh, share with us uh, what you think about uh, how, when, digital is now seeping into all aspects of the society and all sectors are being transformed. Uh, how should digital policy making take into account this fact that much of the knowledge, expertise uh, and views should now come from those impacted sectors and how they should be gotten and what should be processes whereby uh, we can continually be in engagement with the, the sectors uh, and continually be able to get perspectives from uh, them. And how do you see that vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, uh, internet governance has been working, including IGF is working and so on. You, you are free to ignore my questions and just comment to on the workshop note and the earlier uh, speakers. But I thought I'll, I'll just uh, give you a segue uh, if you wish to take that. So Jamila, please, thanks so much. Thank you, Parminder. I couldn't uh, miss this session. I was very interesting to hear uh, what you have been working and it has been very interesting to now. Actually, a lot of what um, was presented to now resonates a lot with what uh, the approach we are trying to develop from Latin America, the Rechos Digitales. Um, we have been um, developing some um, efforts uh, and to go to part of your question, Parminder, we also see a lot of space for uh, building bridges bridges among, among communities and organizations that work in different fields of uh, digital um, of social justice deba debates and we see that as an urgent uh, need but we also see that there are still a lot of challenges in how do we do we develop that and i guess one of the things i i, I was um it was taking my attention had to do with the language as we were saying and it's not only about um, different languages and different idioms that we talk in this uh, global forum but including inside our countries or inside our regions how the type of work and the type of culture that we have and we as a digital rights organization uh, from other uh, movements that have longer histories, have other traje trajectories, has also shown as um, sometimes a challenge for us to, to, to connect. And we have been um, dedicating a lot uh, in these past years to precisely 
expand digital rights discussions to other fields uh, beyond these digital rights communities. And at the same time, and I guess I will focus a bit more on that, we have been uh, pushing for um, new languages and um, new perspectives inside the digital rights communities. Derechos Digitales is an organization that is a pioneer in discussing digital rights in Latin America. It was founded in 2005 when these discussions were, st were still initiating in the region. Now it is uh, a regional organization working in all Latin American countries. But um, our main effort is to bring social justice in a decolonial perspective to these discussions. And I guess this is uh, something that you have touched a lot. And another thing that we feel it's, is relevant uh, is in this particular moment is to denaturalize the idea of digital transformation. I guess this is kind of a, a negative perspective if you wish, but uh, how do we push for bottom up alternatives to this idea or this agenda of digital transformation from the different layers, infrastructure level, protocols, applications. And how do we point out to the limits of this rhetoric of the digital being so key to efficiency and, and data is key to inclusion? And I guess uh, Amber touched this point uh, previously. And how do we recover our own definitions of such concepts? Because um, the idea that development is based on exploitation of data is something that was not necessarily defined by our communities, but it was mostly pushed as part of a business model for some tech corporations to, to survive in several, in several cases, right? So this is something we are um, doing a lot. And what we do is to produce information on, on what is being developed and what are the consequences or what are the impacts of uh, what is being developed right now. Uh, what we have in the region is that in name of innovations, countries facilitate privatization, data exploitation, as several of you have said, uh, by big tech corporations without any type of balancing of public and citizens' interest and fundamental rights. So um, usually these public-private agreements are, are presented as for free, so you have little space for negotiating conditions on the adoption of such technologies. We have seen that in the education uh, sector, we have been seen that in the welfare sector, we have seen that in the health se sector, and we have been trying to map and understand how that has been operating during the pandemic particularly. You have no transparency, no space for participation, for broader participation, and that's very contradictory with the history that we have in Latin America of uh, social participation and public participation in policy making in several of our countries. Um, the regulatory approach mostly in these cases seek to facilitate um, these initiatives without any safeguards, as I said, and as several of you have pointed out, deregulation is the, the norm. So you see exceptions, ambiguities, we will have some um, regulatory developments that we could uh, uh, celebrate in terms of data protection, for instance, but you also see even in the good uh, practices and the good examples that we could have in that in that sector that you have a lot of ambiguities and a lot of exceptions that respond to some um, uh, structural and, and, and geopolitical dynamics as how, how we are in as a region in this in these disputes. And you also have this naturalization of inequality and discrimination by design, I would say. You could see that uh, with digital, digitization of uh, welfare strategies and uh, in several countries. In Brazil, for instance, we had a uh, policy for a cash transfer program that was very important during the pandemic last year, and it was fully uh, digitized. It was only accessible by uh, mobile apps, for instance. And when I say that it's, it's discriminatory by design, you have discrimination in the idea that you don't have an alternative for using, for requiring a public benefit, for requiring a right uh, to the government if you don't have access so you have the idea of everybody has access and more than that the same application was developed to be used um, 
only by one person in one cell phone. So people, the assumption was that not only that everybody, including people that were in need for emergency cash transfer, cash transfer during the pandemic had access to internet, access to an individual private uh, device that could be used for that. And that was not, uh, of course, a reality as you can imagine, not even in, in, in Brazil or the region globally, of course. And, and finally, um, we also believe we still need to insist in the human rights agenda that we are disputing globally, uh, regionally. And I guess the IGF is also part of these, these is also a space to dispute these concepts and this agenda. Uh, the context is that um, that countries have to stick to the communities they already adopted in terms of um, human rights standards. Um, the need to recognize that some technology, and I guess that goes back to my second point, some technology are not aligned with such commitments. It might be necessary not only to regulate, but even to limit some types of implementations. You could mention facial recognition, for example, that is quickly expanding in the region. And we are still in the context in which social movements are censored, they're criminalized, they're surveyed, they're attacked only and off, online and offline. And that's, um, that's something that is unacceptable if we want to advance in building communities, if we want to advance in demanding participation. So we, we also believe that the human rights agenda is a way to escape this corporate language of ethics that is usually activated to evade regulation and it's incorporated by governments basically to enable privatized digitalization without, without safeguards. And, and so to summarize, I guess these are some of the strategies we have been adopting when thinking about um, how do we promote better participation and how do we promote and how do we recover alternatives, even alternatives that were part of the uh, of our history of how uh, we discussed technology previously and that seemed to be pushed aside. Um, and well, that's uh, how we are seeing the, the discussion. And again, um, congratulate for the event and also for the initiatives of building these bridges and seeking for community participation in, this, in these discussions and looking forward to continue collaborating with you in this. Well, thank you, Jamila. Uh, I mean one thing the just net coalitions uh, delhi declaration the formative principles had and you talked about in terms of the welfare state and what's happening in brazil uh, one is the right to not be on the internet uh, was uh, recognized as a founding principle we have a right not to be on the internet and still get uh, public services you were talking about and i think one of the most important points theoretically in that sense theoretical practically is what you said that when we go out and try to engage with other uh, social justice community, we have to change and challenge uh, concepts and notions which we have internally built inside the digital community because right now, and we have tried to talk a lot of, it takes a lot of time because the, the language, the vocabulary is, so one, it is different. And second, it's actually uncomfortable for them. It's not only different uh, because like I'm talking English and you, you, you are talking uh, Portuguese, but they already feel that uh, it is in a way wrong or problematic, a lot of language. Uh, uh, some may, they may have to change uh, to recognize new realities, but a lot the internally the digital communities uh, have to change in the kind of denaturalization uh, you, you, you were uh, talking about. So I think I'll uh, just like very short time, but Sean, can you drive next 10 minutes or eight minutes uh, for a discussion, cross-cutting discussion on the thing and how things should be taken forward, thanks. Uh, no, I'm not going to say how things should be taken forward. It's not up to me. <laughs> but yes, I'm calling back uh, again for questions. We, we did have a, a question coming in there from uh, Sonakshi uh, Agawal um, uh, for um, Natchiket. Uh, and let's have a look at that while others think about uh, what they want to uh, do. It's um, how labor movements now have a, a new beast to deal with in the form of algorithm software governing more and more aspects of the work. There's increased vagueness uh, among labor rights groups now about what one is fighting against due to non-expertise and technical jargon. Um, how are the workers and farmers you work with dealing with this? And how is MKSS or other coalitions 
um, you're part of attempting to make these things more transparent. This is a question that maybe some of the others uh, would like to uh, tackle as well. It's a very important one. Uh, should I go, Sean? I uh, do, please. And others can come in after if you like. Okay, so I'm also conscious of time. So just very quickly, there are three things I would like to say. Uh, first is, I think, and this is also an area MKSS works in. Uh, I think broadly, a lot of what digitalization is doing is taking away uh, people's choice in what they want to engage with. So I guess in terms of messaging to make it easier to understand uh, what we're trying to say basically to the people we work with is, you know, that this is taking away participation. So we are trying to see how we can get participatory decision making back and how can we democratize these technologies. So I guess in terms of messaging, that is what uh, we are trying to communicate. And just in terms of the methods we're adopting, I think uh, a lot of interactive meetings uh, also trying to now do meetings between sectors so often when you have to talk to someone who doesn't understand your jargon you have to simplify it so much that you know then the message gets across and uh, i think the third point i would like to make also is 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 again regarding language so when this concept paper came when you have to communicate it to people who don't know English, when you can't use those technical terms uh, and you're forced to say it in another language, I think that helps simplify. It helps one automatically simplify concepts for oneself. And when you try to communicate it in, in other languages, uh, I think it forces you to mentally simplify things and make them more comprehensible. Um, that's it. I hope that answered the question. Would somebody else like to come in on that one? We have five minutes left. I, I, I totally sympathize with what was being said there um, as well. And it's not just about language, but when you're forced to try and get somebody else who's not familiar with an area to understand what you're trying to say, you often learn an awful lot yourself and uh, about how you communicate your ideas, but also how valid your ideas are. So that kind of being forced to communicate and to simplify it can be a very positive uh, process. Are there others who'd like to come in there? Uh, yeah, um, I had two comments actually on the uh, labor uh, issue. Uh, of course, uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, certain companies, Uber comes to mind, but it's not the only one. There are many are basically evading uh, labor law by classifying people as independents. And so they don't have to pay unemployment insurance and uh, uh, other things like that. Now, in almost every jurisdiction where that's been litigated, uh, Uber has actually lost. Uh, and in some cases, then it's tried to change the law, et cetera. But so one key point is to watch out for the fact that some of these companies are profitable because they're actually getting around the rules. Uh, you know, another example is Booking.com, which can be perfectly, uh, sorry, um, uh, Airbnb, which can be perfectly legitimate, but it's turned into a, a situation where some people actually buy up a whole bunch of apartments in one building and rent them out. So they're actually running a hotel without being subject to all of the safety and other regulations of, of hotels. So that's one thing to keep in mind. We do have the tools to keep these people, uh, quote unquote, honest <clears throat> by applying the, the legislation that already exists. Uh, the other comment is not related to that. Jamila made me think of something. Uh, Jamila mentioned that we've uh, most of this ICT stuff is towards efficiency, which is true. And we've forgotten that there are other things than efficiency, in particular, uh, redundancy and reliability. And again, the pandemic is a great example. The global supply chains, just at the beginning, note the supply masks were super efficient. Yes, when nobody needed that many masks. And when everybody needed masks, all of a sudden we discovered that the global supply chain didn't work anymore <clears throat> because of the travel restrictions uh, and so on. And so you actually needed redundancy. You need to be able to produce masks in more than one place. And so we need to bring back these values other than efficiency and say, yes, efficiency is good, but it's not everything. There's equity, social equity, economic equity, which we've discussed, but there's also reliability, redundancy, uh, resilience against uh, uh, catastrophes, emergencies, etc. So those have to be balanced. We can't push only efficiency. Thanks. The organizers have a countdown here. It's down at two minutes 40. So I'm going to ask Parminder 
When is he uh, and when is IT for Change and the project going to enable more of these kind of get togethers? Because it's clear that there's a huge amount to talk about. Uh, I mean, so many things have come up there, but if we are to move forward, there's going to have to be an awful lot more interaction. So up to you, Par Parminder, tell us the next steps. So. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, so within this so-called project uh, framework, uh, we, uh, we and Sean knows it, we have uh, done a huge amount of communication with so-called traditional organizations in each uh, traditional organization involved with the different sectors. Uh, and it is a part of this journey over the next year to get them together to do the kind of conversation we are doing uh, here. Uh, I think a more relaxed uh, conversation has been better structure, structured one as well. So that's going to happen uh, in, in, in the next few, uh, few months. But as you would have also seen from the workshop note and what we have been talking that, and this is, still an idea, JustNet Coalition is internally going to talk more about it, but we almost think that this is the direction JustNet Coalition should take as a coalition to work in this manner, to focus its energy into those spaces which Jamila also talking about between the digital activists and the impacted sectors and bring those voices, the perspectives into digital policy making. Uh, and to the extent needed, build the capacity, but I mean, we have a lot to learn from each other. So there would be meetings uh, of this kind. Uh, you can be looking at it within three, four months uh, as a part of actually this project. Uh, and also uh, we'll keep uh, you informed uh, uh, about how this project goes, but in the same time, how the JustNet coalition reshapes itself on a standing basis as a bridge builder. Uh, and we, uh, we welcome you to contribute ideas on this. I just gave the, uh, email on in the chat, but most of you probably know us already. So, so happy to hear your views. And, and I think we are at the time when we have to log on. You, you are indeed, they're giving me signals here. I think it's worked, uh, worked out quite well. I want to congratulate the technical staff here as well, but mainly at IT for Change, of course, and everybody else who, who has made this possible. So thanks very much from my side. And we'll Thank all be seeing each other again. And thanks, Sonakshi Agarwal, Deepti, uh, were mainly responsible for getting this workshop together, but also all the participants uh, who came up. So. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everyone.